We are here in the final hour, and we have a special guest to close it all out, live from the Combine in Indianapolis, Mike Griffith, joining us to give us the latest on what is going on up there and what he's been working on. Headline in Dog Nation and hiring Josh Crawford, Kirby Smart hopes to replicate the Dell McGee blueprint. Griff, thanks for the time. Always great to see you. And uh, you so, so tell us about uh, the latest iteration of Kirby Smart. Yeah, I mean, Georgia with some coaching turnover, attrition like everyone else, Dell McGee getting the head coaching job. And, and so in comes Josh Crawford, a guy that played running back in college and has a lot of experience coaching the high school ranks, some of the powerhouse programs in Georgia. Last year he was at Georgia Tech, a couple years before that at Western Kentucky. So you got a young, hungry coach ready for the grind, ready to embrace what college football is now. And, and Dell turning the page, uh, becoming the head coach he's wanted to be for a while. Uh, some, I guess, new blood's the best way to say it. And I think it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a good seamless transition for Georgia at that position. Certainly, with success, my turnover occurs. We've seen that at Alabama over the years, yeah. and and now we're seeing it at Georgia. We had a chart on earlier that uh, Glenn Schumann, the uh, defensive coordinator, uh, for a, he's moved up along the ranks. Uh, is the only guy remaining from the early days of, of Kirby Smart. That, that is pretty remarkable, uh, and there doesn't appear, at least not yet, to be any drop-off, does there? Well, I mean, they haven't lost a regular season game since 2020, um, so that's three straight undefeated regular seasons. And, you know, you pointed out that Kirby Smart's had a lot of success to the point where uh, he doesn't get voted Coach of the Year because the voters say he's supposed to win. I've never seen anything like that, but that, that seems to be the logic. Uh, as far as why Kirby can't win a coach of the year, he, he's supposed to win, they say. So three straight undefeated regular seasons. You mentioned it, Paul. They've recruited well. And, and yet, and still, uh, they didn't make the playoff last year. And even though I, I know the odds came out today in Georgia and Texas, according to these guys in Vegas, they're the two favorites to make the playoff. Um, you still got to go out there and play those games. And uh, Georgia opens against the Clemson team. It's got 18 starters coming back in Atlanta. So uh, it'll be a tough road to hoe. Uh, it will, but it doesn't seem like much is going to slow this program down. So, uh, Mike, I know this is maybe an obvious or an easy question. Maybe it's not. Uh, but when you have that much coaching, uh, coaching turnover, uh, it does seem to land on Kirby Smart as the glue that holds it all together. Elaborate. Well, sure. You know, and, and Kirby's got a mission and, and a way about going things. And, and James Coley, Paul, even though, you know, he's a quote-unquote new coach, this is a guy that's been there before. He coached with Kirby for four years of course, he went on to Texas A&M in 2020 and, and spent some some time there. And that's obviously going to be a, a pivotal state with Texas coming into the SEC and really becoming a focal point, uh, you know, with the money that they have to spend in NIL, uh, with the size of the city of Austin, just all those high school players, uh, if Texas ever puts it together and, you know, really makes Texas such a big threat. Um, you know, so it's good that that Kirby's got a guy in James Coley that's been in Texas for a few years, known best, though, Paul, for recruiting Florida. Um, you know, guys like Tyson Campbell and James Cook. Uh, he's the guy that flipped George Pickens, the last five star receiver that George has signed. So I, I think it, I think in James Coley, you're getting a guy that's really going to jack up the recruiting game. And, and I really like this young coach, uh, Coach Crawford, at the running back position. I think Georgia needed a boost like that. I think the time he's good with Trevor Etienne coming in. I think the Georgia backfield is going to be pivotal to their hopes this year. Cause I'm not sure that their receiving core uh, is going to be equal to what they had last year. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about that because we, we talk in, 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 in schedule so much, but we, we haven't really talked to you about this football team and they're, they're going to hit the spring here soon. You mentioned mm -hmm. Etienne. That's a, just a massive pickup. Uh, Try to give us a, a roadmap to what this uh, offense, and then we'll get to the defense in a minute, is going to look like. Well, they've got to get they got to get the run game going. If you go back to the SEC championship game when Alabama beat them, Georgia had trouble converting on third and short, and, and Georgia was, if not the best, one of the best converting third downs all year, and, and that was where they really failed uh, was their ability to move the ball against the Crimson Tide's front seven on the ground. I, I think this year that's going to be a big area of emphasis. I think you're going to see a, a strong run game from Georgia, probably better than last year's. Those running backs last year were a little bit banged up. Uh, you know, you saw the big tight end coming in from Stanford. They're going to continue to play a lot of double tight end formations, a lot of power football, 
try to put that defense in compromising situations and, and match up nightmares and then let Carson go deep, right? And, you know, the play action shot plays. That's what, that's what Kirby likes to do. That pro style of offense where the quarterback can go to the line with a lot of options. Do they run it? Do they pass it? Depends on what the defense is doing. Depends on the defensive personnel down in distance, but he likes to keep his quarterback in control. And in Carson Beck, he's got a guy who's really good with pre-snap reads and has the NFL arm that can make all the throws. Uh, but this is all predicated, Paul, on being able to run the ball effectively. You've got to be able to hit it hard. And in ETN, I think they've got a thousand yard back. I, I think this is the most complete back they've had uh, since DeAndre Swift. I, I mean, I'm expecting really big things uh, from ETN, both on the ground and as a pass catcher out of the backfield. Mike Griffith with us. Mike, I know we joked a little bit, or at least I did, the, the last time you were here about the schedule. Yeah. But just looking at it, 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 it's fairly chilling when you think. You mentioned Clemson at the beginning and at Alabama, at Texas, and at Ole Miss. I mean, those are th – realizing Georgia will be number one, but those are three schools on the road that will be in the preseason top ten. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to find a schedule. It's impossible to find a schedule that looks like that. And, and I know that Georgia has all these, all these attributes that you've mentioned. They'll start number one, and they haven't lost a game in a regular season game in forever. But uh, is there any level of concern? There has to be some about that road. Uh, yeah, there's concern in general. I mean, they were preseason number one last year, and you know, they won 29 games in a row, but it, it didn't matter. Uh, they weren't able to beat Alabama in the SEC championship game. And, you know, Nick Saban, of course, he'll always be remembered as one of the greatest coaches uh, of all time. You know, we'll be treated to watching him on game day this year. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. But to your point, that Georgia scheduling, I, I just I don't think you can gloss right over uh, Mark Stoops. I mean, remember, this is a guy that, that we thought might be going to and I think that's a really good football coach. And you catch Kentucky on the road early in the season uh, before there's injuries. I mean, later in the year, Kentucky gets a little banged up, maybe doesn't have the depth uh, championship depth of, of other programs, but I, I don't think you can gloss right over that Kentucky game any more than you can look past Clemson that has 18 starters back. I mean, and then won their last five games ever since the, the that silly uh, Tyler caller called out Dabble. they haven't lost a game since. And uh, they've really approached the season with a uh, off season with a, a vengeance. You can look at the recruiting trail, uh, I think Clemson's a big threat. You know, I know right now uh, Kirby Smart doesn't think much past spring drills. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we've talked a lot about offense, Paul, but defensively, you know, that run defense sank all the way down to 18th in the country. Uh, and, and that's a run defense that had led the nation in run defense three of the prior four years and was number two in 2021 when, when they had five first-round D linemen. Um, how Georgia does up front with guys like Warren Brinson and Nazir Stackhouse coming back their ability to reload uh, is going to be really pivotal to whether or not Georgia can win a title. I mean, Kirby said last spring that they didn't have any train records or havoc makers. And, and some of the guys on the, on his team responded and say, Oh yeah, we are coach. Well, no, they weren't. And they got pushed around. Alabama was able to run the ball effectively on them. I know I, I keep throwing that name out there. That's the program that beat them last year. Okay. That used to be the standard in the sec with Nick Saban. We, we don't really know. Uh, what to expect this year. It's going to be very different. We know what Vegas tells us uh, that, that Georgia and Texas are top tier. And, you know, they got the second tier there with, I guess, Old Miss is the third highest favored and then Tennessee and then Alabama, like you mentioned, uh, I think LSU is in that, in that tier as well. Um, that's just going in, but after one week, I mean, who knows what happens when Texas plays at Michigan? What does that look like? What happens when Georgia plays at Kentucky? Things can change really fast in the SEC. And nobody knows that better than, than Billy Napier. Uh, to That used to be a game yeah. that everybody circled on the Georgia calendar. I, I, I believe you were in Gainesville recently uh, for the Spurrier Award. And I'm curious, <laughs> uh, first of all, how's, how's, how's the HBC? But, but most important, what did you pick up there about the state of uh, that program? Well, there's a lot of optimism, believe it or not. I, I mean, at, at that event, I mean, obviously everyone was there to celebrate uh, Coach Spurrier and and last night, Mark Richt was honored as the legend coach. It was kind of fun to watch him and Spurrier kind of, you know, trade barbs. And, you know, Mark Rick revealing that at one point he got cut uh, from a USFL team by Spurrier, who didn't even realize that. It was just kind of and Spurrier going back and, you know, remembering the exact plays and exact moments of the game and talking about Rick. Being, it, was, it was a lot of fun, Paul. You know what it's like 
at those sort of functions. And of course, Jamie Chadwell was there from Liberty. And I don't know why he's not an SEC head coach yet. Uh, he will be very soon. This guy is really good. Uh, but talking to a lot of the Florida boosters, um, you know, they looked at the first half of the schedule and they said, you know, if Florida can just get some momentum going. And, uh, one, you know, one guy told me this is the most talent they've had uh, since the Dan Mullen era. So there, there is some guarded optimism uh, at Florida. There's a lot of trust in Scott Strickland. I mean, that's a guy you sat down with uh, last year at the spring meetings and, and told you that they were going to be patient with Billy Napier. And I think that right now there is some guarded optimism uh, in Florida that maybe Billy Napier, I mean, you look at his resume, say this, when you look at Billy Napier's resume and the places that he's been, he's been around the SEC. He's coached at other schools. I mean, it's better than some of the other coaches coming to the league. When you just sit down and look at where he's been and where he's coached, you, you can really make a better case. He was a better hire than a lot of these guys, even though maybe things haven't worked out so far. So, um, you know, now that there's a transfer portal, Paul, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because we don't know what's going to happen after April 15th when there's that second portal window and, and how many players could come pouring out of programs, you know, that may not seem to be what they thought it was when they signed with that program originally. Great stuff. Mike Griffith covering uh, the, the uh, combine. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stay in touch with you all week, uh, Mike. Many thanks for the report. Great to see you. As we head to the break, we have 45 minutes remaining here. Your phone calls are straight ahead. <laughs> 